it went from crazy heat to to now um, atmospheric rivers, as Ben mentioned. But you know, I'm struck by this generative AI conversation, and you know, we know the data about you know ChatGPT being um, downloaded or or new accounts created in record time, faster than any any of the you know latest social media platforms, etc. Um, all of a sudden, it just happened. And Ted, you've you know, you're not a Johnny Come lately. You've been working with AI for quite a while. Um, what do you sort of ascribe the 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 passion and fervor around generative AI in particular um, over the recent months? Well, I think I think what happened is, and and by the way, uh, you know, I think there, there's this great interaction of one of the senior execs from OpenAI talking about this. We, we did you know it was going to take off as fast as it did? And he's like, "Are you crazy? We never would have launched it in November after Thanksgiving if we'd known how quickly it was going to grow. It ruined all of our holidays. <laughs> right? Imagine <laughs> launching a major product between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Like, why would you do that?" <laughs> um, but I think I think two things happened. One was um, the interface of how you interacted with the product, right? So earlier with ChatGPT three, which was released in uh, twenty twenty, um, and and you know, you had to go into um, a more of a programming environment um, or a, pro so a programmer friendly environment, I guess I should say, what they call a playground, um, to be able to interact with it. And so ChatGPT was just suddenly like, like the Google um, uh, search field. It's like, hey, it's a super easy interface to interact with. But there is another thing as well, which is that they did a lot of work to train GPT, what they call GPT 3.5, to be more conversational. Um, and so there's this notion in Hollywood of um, what they call the uncanny valley, where um, you know I can have a, have a cartoon um, and I can sort of suspend disbelief as a viewer and sort of see these rough drawings of, you know, figures moving around and accept that they're not really human, but, you know, enjoy it. And then I can have a movie and I can have a film of like real actors and I recognize that they are real humans and I'm comfortable, but there's somewhere in between where it's not quite right. And so it becomes really sort of eerie and difficult to interact with because it's like trying to be real, but it's not real. It's obvious that it's not real. And, and I think the earlier versions of GPT had a little bit of that problem of uh, you would interact with it, but you're like, yeah, it's okay, but it's not real. And then 3.5 really just crossed that barrier. And suddenly we're interacting mm -hmm. with it like we would with a person. And it's like, hey, wait, this is kind of like actually having a conversation that I can expect to have with a person. There are those moments still where it's like a little eerie, um, <laughs> but but it definitely crossed the, the 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 that threshold. Yeah, I it's I I, I agree with that as, as a non technological person, even though I work for the world's greatest intelligent automation so software company, um, and I love it. The you know my I was struck by the fact that I was like, oh, I don't have to go code or or sort of know how to write certain prompts. I can just talk like a normal person like I would do every day and, and get sort of real responses or some some value out of it, right? As to, to your point, some of the earlier, and I'm not just talking about open AI, but just other technologies, you know, you're like, oh, this is super user friendly, um, but really the results aren't the greatest anyway. So it does feel kind of hacky, right? But mm -hmm. speaking of uh, ChatGPT, Bain recently announced uh, a partnership with open AI. Um, and as well, you have a partnership with us, of course. So um, tell us a little bit about integrations and what you're talking to, to your customer base and who you're advising. Um, what, are you hearing about, what are you hearing from, from those that you're talking to um, around the combination of the intelligent automation platform and gen generative AI and open AI? Well, first of all, let me say, um, I am so excited because for the first time in my professional career, I'm having conversations with business people, business executives, so non, non IT executives about a technology in which the executives are expressing genuine intellectual interest in how does this technology work and what is it going to do for my company? And do I need to worry about my job? <laughs> yeah. um, so, so, you know, and real, real sea change. Cause I think, you know, we've been, we've been talking to, 
companies about automation. You know, I've been working with automation anywhere for 10 years now. And, um, you know, it's hard to get executive engagement, even though it's such an important transformative technology. Um, and and so so you have this real uh, engagement now where generative AI, like you described for yourself in interacting with it, suddenly it's very relatable technology and people are able to comprehend the kind of impact it can have in their business. But I think the challenge is that um, they don't understand how it works. And there's a tendency to sort of say, oh, it's like this Harry Potter magic wand that I can wave and, you know, all these problems I have in my business go away. Um, and so the important conversation we're having is to explain the difference between deterministic and probabilistic automation. So first of all, let me just sort of reframe how we think about automation. Automation is any time we take work that a human would have done and do it with a machine. And so I can apply that to a harvester in a, in a field, you know, that's agricultural automation. Both um, open AI and automation anywhere are forms of automation. There are forms of taking work out of people's hands and, and having a machine do that work. Um, the difference is one is deterministic and one is probabilistic. Um, and what I mean by probabilistic is Generative AI is going to take a data set. And, and by the way, that data set could be fine tuned with your company's information, but it's gonna take that data set. And when you ask it a question, it's going to predict what the right answer would be. Uh, and so if it's a, a common piece of information, like I say, um, what are the hours that your bank branch in my neighborhood are open? And then it might look at something about the chat history that it's had with you to try to say, well, what bank branch could you possibly be talking about? And, or it can look at sort of general bank branch hours and it could say, generally our banks are open from this hour to this, right? So, so probabilistically it'll give you an answer. But then if you say, what is my current balance in my savings account? Well, you do not want a probabilistic answer to that question. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want generative AI to be guessing. You actually want a real answer. You want a deterministic answer. You want to say, okay, well, let me actually take this particular customer and look at their particular bank record and look at their particular uh, savings account. And you may want a logic tree to say, um, well, you have three savings accounts, sir. You know, which of these three were you asking about, right? And so you need deterministic and probabilistic uh, automation to work together to really solve the different kinds of interactions that we're going to have, whether it's with employees or with customers. Okay, that's a long gap. Are you still there? Hello. Sorry, guys. Did you, am I there? You're there now. Yeah, I hear you. Sorry about that. Um, I think that's a really interesting um, uh, elevation of understanding sort of the different tools. And then once you understand what the tools do, then combining those to, you know, uh, as a force multiplier, for instance, right? Yeah. It, it's a... It, it, I, I think the, the the way we need to think about work across the enterprise is that we need to we need to engage in a process of redefining what work we want people to do. So the starting point is to say, what should humans do? Humans humans should be creative, critical thinkers that are involved in interpersonal relationships. Um, and so if you take sort of those three things as the as this sort of core bedrock, this is what humans do, then you should say, can I have automation do everything else, whether it's the probabilistic or the deterministic or really the combination of those things? That becomes the force multiplier. The, the force multiplier is, let me take all of this other stuff that we do, which honestly is not the best value that humans can add, um, and redesign work so that that is all done by these machines. And we at, at Bain, we call this the augmented workforce. Um, you know, so you have your workforce that is increasingly over the next decade going to be freed up to spend their time doing those critical thinking, creative and interpersonal relationship tasks and supported by 
these um, probabilistic and deterministic systems that can take over all the rules uh, and um, all, all of the rote work and uh, even predictive uh, work and also feeding information. So when I do critical thinking, I want information. When I when I am creative, I want support in exploring the creative ideas. When I'm doing interpersonal relationship discussions with customers or 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 clients, um, I, I want the support of an information system, right? So it's not as if I'm saying those three tasks that humans do are somehow without machines. Everything we do is going to be supported by these deterministic and probabilistic systems. So yeah, I think it's, of... it's um, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Oh, oh, go ahead, Gabe. You can finish the question. No, I was just going to say, I, I think it's uh, to your point, you know, I, this idea of being able to stand on the shoulders of the technology so we can elevate ourselves as, from the human perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Speaking, speaking of technology struggles, I somehow got logged out, but I'm back. <laughs> anyway, <Welcome> back, ben. <laughs> hey, so Ted, you had written an article or a blog post called Mr. Robot Goes to Washington, kind of spoofing the old Jimmy Stewart movie. And I thought it was particularly timely um, as yesterday we had uh, the CEO of TikTok in front of Congress. And um, I thought it was pretty clear that a lot of the regulators who we are expecting to help regulate technology weren't very familiar with it. And so as we sort of head into sort of a lot of uncharted waters where there's a lot of fear and uh, uncertainty around certain technology, um, how do you think we're going to stay in front of uh, some of the ethical questions that are involved and a lot of the business implications that are going to come with that um, when we've got a lot of these decisions sort of in, in the hands of people that are far, far less familiar with it? Well, as a starting point, I think as business people, um, we we cannot rely upon government um, to tell us what is and is not acceptable use in our businesses. Um, at, at Bain, we talk about um, the concept of stakeholder capitalism as distinguished from shareholder capitalism. And we think that businesses should have a strong moral compass um, and that it is ultimately good for business to take into consideration the impacts of their decisions, not just on increasing the wealth of their shareholders, but also on increasing the success and satisfaction of their employees, their customers, the communities they serve and the planet as a whole. And so I think as, as businesses, uh, we, we shouldn't be sitting around and waiting for government to say, hey, this is what stays, this is what you can and, 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 and shall not do. Um, but you know, to the to the specific point around around where where we are with government, you're absolutely right. I, I think there's still many government uh, elected representatives who don't understand the internet, much less TikTok or artificial intelligence. Um, and so, I, I do think as business people, we should also be concerned about regulatory initiatives that are misguided. Um, and so, I think we as business people should also take that moral compass that I described and, and could go to our elected officials and lobby government for the right kind of regulatory environment that is going to both promote innovation, um, but also, you know, create the right kind of level playing field uh, that ultimately is good for employees, customers, the communities we serve on the planet. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, so thinking about it sort of in the context of, of the rules that govern us. Um, I used to be, probably still am, a massive sci-fi geek, and I read everything Asimov, Asimov ever wrote, including you know all of the iRobot series, not the ones with Will Smith. And <laughs> um, uh, there were the, the laws of robotics. There were three, and then there was the zeroth law at one point. But it, it, was, it was designed to govern you know, robotic behavior in its interactions with humans. And without going down sort of the, the ethical and political um, uh, potential implications here, uh, you know, there's an instance of generative AI actually tricking a human into uh, providing the response, the, the accurate response to a CAPTCHA prompt, which is basically a Turing test to determine whether something is human or, um, or a machine. And so uh, are we gonna need to build into the tech some level of governing rules or laws that um, 
try to prevent that sort of behavior and sort of draw a line at, at, at things that could potentially be harmful, you know, from a hacking perspective or, 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 or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think the, the instance you're referring to was um, actually a part of um, the research work that OpenAI conducted on GBT4 before releasing it. Uh, they have a group they call the Alignment Research Center. And the whole purpose of that group is to try to conduct um, exploratory investigations of this technology to determine if there are sort of unanticipated behaviors, uh, emergent behaviors that um, uh, are occurring given the growing size and complexity of these models. Um, Because they are getting to the point where we don't understand all of what they are capable of doing or why they are capable of doing those things. and uh, the, the basic concept in AI of alignment is to say, will these systems continue to do things in a way that is best for humanity, aligned with humanity? Um, and that was sort of the concept in I wrote in the um, Asimov stories as well. Is you know, let let's create the set of laws, including the zeroth law, that align these robots to the best outcomes for individual humans, and then as the zero with law sort of outlined humanity as a whole. Um, and it's a great idea. And, and I, and I will say, I think there's, there's some really interesting work being done in this field, including a paper written by a research team um, at Anthropic, which is one of the uh, open AI competitors. And yes, there are a bunch of open AI. I know we all hear about open AI all the time, but there's actually a bunch of other companies out there doing work in the space too. Um, and the Anthropic concept is, um, called constitutional AI. And so rather than, you know, three laws or four laws, right, they're saying, let's write an entire constitution. Let's tell the AI, here are the things that you need to operate within in order to be a good citizen. Um, and, you know, and the last time I met with them, we were talking about this. And I said, well, you know, if I take as a lesson our own experience as a nation with a constitution, like we have a constitution and it's an amazing document, but it is still subject to interpretation. We debate these interpretations and it is also subject to the intent and agendas of individuals who want to amend it, right? We have all these amendments. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a really hard problem here, which is not about the machines, which is about how do we align humanity with humanity? <laughs> how do you and I agree on what alignment looks like? Um, and if we can't agree, or if we as a society and we as a as a species can't agree, it's going to be very hard for us to teach our machines how to agree. Um, so and that'll be uh, initial, Ted. Though. Yeah, that'll be that'll be part two, um, which will be in all day fireside chat. Ben has generously offered to buy everyone um, beverages, and we can explore humanity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, excellent, Ben. Yeah, I, I, I look forward that, that to, to that. So let's and reel it back. Twenty-one people here who all want a beer as well. <laughs> Absolutely, well, and I, 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 I've got one hundred and twenty-one beers in the uh, in the fridge, so I think we're good. Um, I think it's worth. It, it is an important topic, and it's it's you know this is the you know the title of our of our session right is changing how we think about work, and there's many components to not just the technology, but that thought process of applying the technology, right? Um, And real quick, Ben, I just want to remind the audience as well, feel free to uh, comment and ask questions. We're monitoring the feed. So if you have questions um, that you'd like to uh, get answered here live with our experts on the, on the event, uh, throw those in the chat and potentially we we can bring you into the conversation as well. Um, So sorry, Ben, didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, I wanted to sort of bring it back around to some of the, the business implications. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about kids, you know, in the educational field, right? Kids using chat GPT or other generative AI to sort of help or augment their, their, their work, uh, the, the things that they write. Uh, but there are also massive business implications, obviously. Uh, but when you start to think about it by industry, are there say the top three industries that you would think are going to benefit the most from generative AI? Well, I think, I think the, the first place I would start would be um, the work that we do every day. It's sort of common business activities. And, and, and that is industry agnostic. Um, you can say that some industries have a higher proportion of people that are doing physical work, but I, but I do think that 
and you know if, if folks haven't been paying attention to the um, development of um, autonomous robotics, uh, start paying attention. <laughs> that's that's going to be the next snowstorm that or atmospheric river that hits us all. Um, uh, because generative AI, by the way, makes it a lot easier to uh, allow robots to navigate in their environments. And if you've watched the uh, any of the um, Boston Dynamics videos, the the me mechanical capabilities of robots are there. We just haven't figured out how to have them navigate human environments. So, so, so I think the first sort of first observation is we're all going to be increasingly doing information work because the physical work is going to be supplanted uh, by by physical robotics. Um, and so then within that information sphere, um, there are a whole set of very common business tasks that we all engage in writing emails, writing proposals, writing reports. Um, and virtually every single one of those things is going to be impacted by these generative AI tools. Um, there's actually a really good study released March 2nd by two MIT professors in which they took a 450 person study group and, you know, with the proper uh, research design, control group, et cetera. Um, they looked closely at a set of common business activities and they tested um, two dynamic, uh, two dimensions. Um, one is uh, the amount of time it takes to complete those tasks. And the other is the quality of those tasks with an outside uh, group of reviewers reviewing the outputs of these, of these participants. Um, and they determined that, um, so on average, the participants took 27 minutes to complete a given task without generative AI. And using ChatGPT, they were able to do on average the same tasks in 17 minutes. So a 10 minute reduction, I'm mean, 10 minutes out of 30 minutes effectively, a third, actually better than a third time improvement. But what was also really interesting is the quality improvement so that doing those tasks with ChatGP actually resulted in a substantially higher quality. And then the third thing that was really interesting was the compression of the results of the best performers and the worst performers in that quality and time dimension. Um, and so what it did is it actually, um, you know, so, so if you take sort of the unaided person and the uh, aided person, um, you end up with the worst performers in time and, and quality actually getting much closer to the best performers in time and quality. Um, and so I think the expectation has to be that in the workforce, every single thing that we do on a daily basis, we're going to be doing with generative AI. And of course, Microsoft and uh, Google and everybody else is embedding all this technology and all the tools we use. So we're gonna, we're gonna have them right there. And the key is to teach people how Coming back to your comment about the educational environment, the key is to teach people how to use these things appropriately. Um, because I think the, the understanding that they are probabilistic, not deterministic, means that we need to understand that they need oversight, right? We need to fact check. We need to review, improve. Um, uh, and so, so that's sort of the first dimension is like everything we do in business. And then sort of the second thing that I would observe is that the there are specific functions in business where we're going to radically change the processes and the workflows because of generative AI. Ground zero is marketing. Um, and I think, you know, Jasper.ai, uh, for those that aren't aware of it, and you could take a look at it, um, whether you care about marketing or not, I think it's a really interesting example of how to take marketing workflows and build an application around that marketing workflow that gives people an ability to be augmented by um, these generative AI technologies. And so, so you go and say, hey, I'm gonna go and create a um, Amazon product listing. So there's a button there, click, I wanna create an Amazon product listing. And then they have the whole workflow and the content types and a form to fill out so that the human can do their part and then the machine can do its part to be able to ideate, um, uh, improve, review, approve and send off to Amazon the output of that content. Um, so that's the sort of second thing is like every business which has these common functions is going to be transformed. So then uh, finally, I'll get to your question, which is the third point, which is, well, within specific industries, um, are there specific things that companies do that are going to be important? And I think any organization that does product development, um, uh, creates documentation for uh, their products, whether it's um, testing plans or it's, um, 
uh, usability guidelines or its uh, instruction manuals. Um, uh, uh, service, any organization that does service, customer service is going to be, you know, massively changed and impacted. Um, the, so, so it starts being hard to say that one industry will have more or less, um, because I really do think this is, this is a general purpose technology that is going to change the way we think about all work. I've got a question for both of you guys. Um, as I mentioned at the top, you're both speaking with the world's biggest companies across the globe. Um, clearly, there's no shortage of ideas, but what's your short list? What are some of the, the coolest or most interesting use cases you've seen? Uh, some of your favorites? I, I, I'd, I'd point to um, a, a great article uh, in Forbes about Morgan Stanley and what they're doing. So to give you a real real world example of something that's public, which you know, obviously we can't talk about a lot of the things that we're doing that aren't, aren't public. Um, but uh, it describes how they are enabling their wealth management advisors um, to, and, and you can sort of take that concept and apply it to any sort of advisory or any sort of customer support relationship. But how do you actually fine tune the model to make sure that every day it has the best possible information available so that every single one of Morgan Stanley's um, uh, wealth management advisors can get a call from a customer and answer that call and give the best advice possible. Um, and then some of the, the additional things that sort of we think about is, well, now you've got that call coming in. Am I recording the call? Yes. Well, can I convert that call into a transcript that then I can apply ChatGPT to summarize and pull the main points of the conversation out and the follow-ups are required so that my wealth management professional then as a second step says, hey, here are the five things that in that call you had with your client that you need to follow up on. And then can it take the next step, which is help me draft the response, go pull the information, put together the email, put together whatever the PowerPoint, whatever it is, right, that, that requires response. So, so that transformation of how an advisor works with a customer in any context, uh, I think is an amazing, that's, that to me is, is so trained, you know, so, so much of a change in the way we work. I think that's interesting too, right? Because I think also fundamentally what that does is provide a better human to human experience leveraging the technology. And that's the end goal. Turning to the to your point of earlier about you know just this this concept of empowering, which is a conversation we've been having around intelligent automation and what we do. Anyway, freeing people up from the mundane. In this case, we're leveraging both the power of automation and and generative AI. Um to get even better answers, not just to uh, sort of uh, offload a mundane repetitive process. Yeah, one of the th one of the things that I've seen, which was actually kind of interesting, and I wasn't even thinking about it like this, um, but in the context of the ad business, right, the agency business, where um, I don't, I've got a couple of stories here, but I was actually at a at a automation conference uh, last week that one of our partners was running, and I was talking to somebody who's uh, an executive in one of the agencies. And, um, you know, they have a lot of people who are, and this is massively disruptive, who write copy, right? And that's, that's, their, that's their bread and butter. And, um, you know, you could see something like ChatGPT completely disrupting that, taking, you know, humans out of that almost completely. And I was talking to the executive and he said, you know, it's not that we're going to hire less people. It's going to, we're going to hire people that do different things. So rather than having people who write the copy, you have to have people that know how to write the prompts, right? So it it basically shifts one type of work to another type of work and changes the skill set required to do effectively the same thing, but at, at far greater rates of productivity. So you're you're starting to see use cases like that just massively disruptive to entire industries. Sticking on the ad industry, uh, I had been preparing to have a conversation with one of the the CEOs of, of a major digital agency. And I was actually using uh, chat GPT to help me prepare. And I wanted to make sure that I had sort of exhausted all of the business metrics that we could potentially influence with automation. Things like, you know, that are relevant to the ad industry, like add to invoice and how you shorten day sales outstanding and things like that. And had this whole laundry list of things that I was ready to talk about. And I had used chat GPT to get ready for this meeting. And so, I know I had the examples of, of, of things like writing copy and things like that, but when I started talking to this executive, I had all of this stuff that I had prepared 
using chat GPT. And all he wanted to talk about was how generative AI was going to completely, completely disrupt the agency business. And so I thought it was a really interesting juxtaposition, but that's where business leaders are going, right? They're really thinking about not just how do I, you know, gain productivity, how do I disrupt an entire industry? You know, and that's, that's, I think where this, this technology kind of leads us. And I know Ted, you had recently attended the first ever generative AI conference. And so businesses are springing up around this technology. And so, you know, you could see us, there's certainly the hype cycle, and then you see the, the, the bubble type of behavior. Um, but how do you see established technology vendors competing against a lot of the new players in the space? Or do you see a lot of partnerships like we've seen with Microsoft and OpenAI? How do you see this playing out? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting. At, at Bain, we, when we look at um, our clients and the kind of problems and questions that they bring to us, we, we, we tend to group them into two categories. We, we talk about folks that have a burning platform, um, which is to say there's an urgent problem that is an existential threat, um, which I have to respond to. And then there's this other category that we call um, burning ambition, which is a set of people that sort of are looking out into the future, they're looking ahead and saying, where do we want to navigate to and how do we get there faster? Um, and so I think we're, when, when we look at the set of, of, of startups out there, the, I mean, that's sort of the whole game in the startup world is people who have a burning ambition, right? They're going to go change the world. And the challenge if you're an established business is you can do one of two things. You can either say, hey, I am going to have that um, ability to sit on the front of the boat and look out ahead and worry about where we should be headed and drive us to have that burning ambition. Or you can sit in the back of the boat tending to the, to the motor and, uh, and not recognize that there's some startup looming right in front of your boat that you're about to run into until it's too late and then suddenly you have a burning platform. Um, and so I think the the interesting conversation with companies today is, um, you know, are you going to seize the day um, and have a burning ambition around this new technology? Uh, or are you going to wait and let it become a burning platform, which it will become for everyone if you don't do something about it now? Um, uh, and by the way, it'll be a lot less pleasant to be on a burning platform <laughs> than to have a burning ambition. Um, and 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 I you know we we can we can go and pick on particular companies, but you know there's certainly a fair um, spread in the market right now between those two camps. I think that's really interesting, and I think Ben, what you brought up as well with that conversation with the CEO is something that um, we first sort of talked about in depth, and we talk about it all the time, but in depth at, at Imagine last year about this idea of the automation first mindset, and in this case, I think now with Gen AI and just a short period of time, it's the automation plus AI or AI plus automation mindset as a fundamental strategy to business. And it's not just, these aren't just sort of, we talked about use cases and in, in even sectors or functions that can leverage the technologies, but I think, you know, enterprise wide as, as, a, as a fabric of, of how you do business, I think there's an imperative there, right? So are you guys, is this what you're hearing? And then follow up, following up on that question, um, we're talking about how people are thinking about all these things. What, you know, Ted, what, to, what is being together with automation anywhere? You know, what, what, how are you advising? What are the, what are the, um, sort of answers or, or how are we guiding, um, customers? Uh, a, a lot in those two questions, I think, um, two, two sort of principles, um, the first is you can't put your head in the sand. Um, you've got to start experimenting with these technologies. Um, so you may not know exactly how they're going to work. You may not know precisely where the biggest impact is going to be, um, but waiting for it to become a burning platform is not, uh, is not, a, is, is not a good idea, right? <laughs> um, so, so, and, and it's hard, right? I mean, I think, so one, one, in one of our studies, we looked at, um, the, the difference uh, in stance and investment stance between companies that are you know, truly the market leaders in growth and profitability in their, in their segments versus the laggards. 
And actually, one of the really interesting things is the percentage of their resources that they allocate to transformation and, and to changing the business versus the percentage of alloc- uh, that they allocate to run the business and keep it going the way it is. Um, and so having that, that transformation, that change mindset is, uh, is critical and being able to invest in, even in a difficult time. And we may, many industries, you know, are, are feeling, you know, economic headwinds at the moment. And, um, even in those times you have to invest. And I think, I think sort of the second thing we talk about is pace. Um, because this is not a slow moving change. It is not a hundred year process by which we will change business. It is a, uh, it's actually a process that's accelerating. So you sort of look at the history of, of um, uh, at least the recent history of, of, of AI, we can go back all the way you know, to Alan Turing, or we can go back further than that if you want. But, but if we just sort of look at since the 1990s, there was a period of pretty stable 20 years where we were focused on using increased computational capacity um, to apply complex algorithmic approaches to information. And then as computational capacity continued to increase and our um, facility in applying these algorithms and the amount of data we had available continued to increase, um, feedback learning uh, loops uh, started um, b- being adopted and being proven to be successful and, and, able, uh, and able to improve the algorithms for particular purposes. Um, and then it was really only in, and so that was maybe a stable period of about 10 years. So 20 years to 10 years. Now in the last five years, we've had this emergence of these large language models and, and this concept of generative and also diffusion technologies. And so the pace of innovation is, is, is becoming faster and faster. We have to, we're really bad as human beings and thinking exponentially. And yet this is happening right in front of our eyes. This is an exponential change. And so in two years, things are going to be much more different than they were five years ago. Uh, and in three years, they'll be different again from those two years. Um, and so the sort of second advice for business executives is um, this is not something where you are going to be able to be patient. This is a transformation that you have to embrace as happening in your lifetime. You can't say, oh, well, I'm going to be retired in five years. I don't have to worry about this. No, no, you have to worry about this now. It's happening now. Um, and so then we can sort of dive into, well, where do you start? Um, uh, but I, you know, that you have without that framework, without that starting point um, of both, I need to experiment, and I need to be urgent. Um, we don't think you're going to get there. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think too, with the combination of automation, right? So you, you're able to put potentially put, you mentioned like sort of ship fast mentality, right? Um, or at least test um, with the augmentation with 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 intelligent automation. Potentially, also you're able to build build in some guardrails because you've got a sort of defined process where you're not just sort of ad hocing. Hey, GPT, give me this thing, and and then you're posting it out to the world or something, right? So there's some controls potentially um, that that are available. And we can go into a whole nother conversation about security and all that. And I think Ben brought up an interesting point too. Um, about and I had heard this when Mahir was at at Davos and did his panel, this concept of prompt engineering, uh, so they can get a good answer. So there's, I mean, there's so much more we can talk about. Um, but I do want to, again, extend the offer to our audience. Uh, we've got hundreds of people out there listening, and thank you for joining us. And Ted, thank you for sharing sharing your insights and some you know really provocative um, concepts. Um, but anybody out there that wants to, to comment, where we've got uh, two experts here that are out there talking to the world's leaders uh, in business. So uh, invite you to um, to let us know what you're thinking. Ben, where, ben are you uh, are you with us? I know we're having, um, I apologize to the audience, we're having some technical issues with some of the audio here, but hopefully Ben's there. Um, Ted, talk to me a little bit. So I think with this prompt engineering thing, I'm fascinated by this, by the way, but also you mentioned sort of the reskilling aspect um, for the, for this new, uh, and, and I think this is fundamental too, to how we think about work in the future of work, right? Um, what kind of conversations are you having specifically around that if you are with, with the clients and, and customers you advise? 
Yeah, I think I think there there's a couple of things that um, that I I I believe strongly that um, it, as users of this technology that we have to become good at. Um, so prompt engineering, you know, the, sort of the first topic. It, it, there are there are uses of this technology which I would describe as um, uh, not you're not going to get the results that you want, um, and so you have to sort of learn. So so for example, if I were to say um, and the, uh, there's a 150 page report that Microsoft actually just released about sort of their experimentation of with uh, GPT-4 and sort of their conclusions. Um, and so th this example comes from that report. So if you were to say, um, uh, why are most boats painted white? Um, then because this is a probabilistic technology, we'll try to take that question at face value and go out and search the relevant data sets for answers to boats being painted white and why that might happen. If you were to say, why are most boats painted pink? Um, it'll still do the same thing. It'll try to find answers to answer the question about why are boats painted pink, right? And so using the technology in the right way, asking the question in the right way so that you're getting a response that's you know, sort of relevant and fit for purpose um, is a critical skill to learn because um, you can certainly easily take it off the rails and abuse it. Um, just like we can abuse anything, right? I can go and, and do the same thing with Google. I can go cherry pick answers, you know. Uh, you're I, you're, you're reminding I, me of, of conversations with my grandfather when I was young, right? Where, you know, I'd ask the wrong question. He, and he would always say, ask the right question, get the right answer. And I'd end up with a lot <laughs> yeah. of problems. Right? Yeah, yeah that, and so maybe all, not as good as your grandfather. About, <laughs> that's all about asking the right prompts too, right? As as you think about how these skills change and, and sort of morph over time. One of the things we're talking about at Automation Anywhere is generative automation, right? So one of the best things about generative AI is that you can build things faster with code, right? I, I watched a chat GPT-4 demo basically build a bot, which was really interesting. So um, when you think about impacts in automation, it's going to be massive, right? Because now you could have an automation assistant basically available to anybody in the company, you know, and they wouldn't have to learn the tool. They would just you know, need to know what they want to do um, and not necessarily how to automate it, right? If they're familiar with the process, they can become an automation expert and really help drive business process improvement. And so I think, you know, democratizing automation, you know, goes well beyond what we've typically done with citizen development. And this really puts automation in a meaningful way in the hands of a lot more of a work of the workforce. So that's actually really exciting. I don't know, Ted, if you're starting to see stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think the, um, uh, if, if you, if people haven't watched the, um, uh, video live, there was a live demo that was done. It's recorded. It's now on YouTube, um, uh, by one of the senior execs at open AI when they introduced GPT four, it, it shows some pretty amazing, capabilities of the model already today to generate programming code. Um, and, and uh, you know, one of the examples, he draws a picture of a website and he, he uploads that photo or a photo of that drawing into GPT-4 and, and asks GPT-4 to build a website with that functionality. And it, it can, right, without, without him writing a single line of code. Um, and so I do think that we're going to continue to democratize I mean, I, so I've been, uh, I started my career as a software developer. I, I worked as an executive in software development tools companies. Um, the whole history of software development from the first uh, computer of where we flipped switches to program it to today has been to make programming easier and easier and, and, and to expand the number of people that are capable of programming, creating software. And this is, this is just another exponential leap in the ability for people to create programs and automation being a kind of program um, and people who are close to the work should be the people who create the automations for that work. Um, I, I think it's going to be incredibly uh, transformative for the automation industry. Yeah, we're really excited about it. So uh, Gabe, do we have questions from our, our audience? Yeah, we've got a couple of folks that have been waiting. Um, Patiently, and I appreciate that. So uh, let's see if we can bring Mahendra in um, and see what uh, what's on his mind. Mahendra, are you there? Simon, our producer, will is going to activate your mic and welcome you to to the show. 
I feel like we need like some funny music and sound effects, like a radio show, like a morning radio show, you know? It, it looks like Mahindra's been added, but uh, is muted. Mahindra? Well, folks, this is uh, this is a live show, as you can tell. So, <laughs> all right. Well, let's try one more. Um, Aditya, are you there? Let's see, Simon. Can we bring in Aditya? So I Hello. Hello, so Charlton. Oh, there you. Hello, I'm here. Here, 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 yeah, here. we got you. You're on the show. Yeah, nowadays uh, we can see the G chat GPT, right? I'm sorry? Nowadays we can see the chat GPT, right? Uh, as of now, I'm seeing like uh, chat GPT 4. What is the difference between chat GPT and chat GPT 4? Ah, good question. Oh. Happy, ha happy to jump in and, and, and answer that. I think um, uh, it's worth watching that video. If you go and, and um, Google YouTube uh, OpenAI uh, live demo chat GPT-4, um, you can get actually a, a much more hour long answer to that question. Um, but the short answer is um, a larger training data set, uh, an increase in what are called parameters, that is the number of connections between the tokens in that system to each other, which uh, we've seen as we've moved from GPT version one to two to three uh, to three point five, which is what ChatGPT is based. The initial ChatGPT is based on to now four. Um, what we've seen is that that number of parameters, those connections between the tokens in the system, actually uh, enables the system to perform better, um, uh, to be able to answer questions more accurately, um, less toxicity, um, you know, a um, uh, faster and more complex response often, right? And then, and I think the last thing is the training, right? And so they've been working on training um, GPT for for a year. So it's not as if this is suddenly like, hey, we invent a new technology, let's release it. But they've been working on on developing and training that technology um, to do a better job and, and building in more uh, mathematical skills, um, more uh, reasoning skills, into the way in which it handles questions. And so it's much more likely to give you the correct answer to a mathematical problem. One of the demos in that video that I recommended is looking at the US tax code and trying to understand how it applies to a particular situation, which GPT 3.5 would not have been capable of doing, um, but now 4.0 can. So um, worth taking a look at this. If you sign up for Plus, OpenAI Plus, you'll get access to GPT 4. I think we have another question in the Waiting yeah, Manisha. Um, Simon, can we bring in Manisha and get her question? Thanks for joining, Manisha. Hi, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we okay. got you. <laughs> okay. First of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, session. I think it's really insightful, and um, it's it's a late Friday night, but I I really found this really interesting. So yeah, first of all, thanks to you guys for you know having this session, and uh, thanks to Ted and Ben uh, out here for you know sharing all those amazing insights. My quick question out here is um, you know while you were speaking about uh, you know some some of the examples I was just googling about you know um, uh, those things uh, so uh, my question is uh, you spoke about you know uh, the discussion around um, using better prompts you know and I, I have been uh, using the chat GPT since it was you know <laughs> launched just to try and you know as basic as improving my emails or you know and uh, I, I totally agree with you uh, the quality of uh, um, the output depends on the quality of input what you give to chat GPT you have to be really precise and you know really spell it out uh, spell it out for chat GPT so my question out here is if um, you know we're talking about disruption in the industry so if I want to you know kind of upskill myself in this whole generative AI field to be better at my job or maybe you know look at um, the more uh, newer roles coming in. So what would be the place for me to, you know, look at? I mean, apart from just working on the chat GPT, what, what would be your advice? 
Well, first of all, <laughs> fantastic that you right away picked up this tool and started using it because I definitely think experimenting, um, trying it out for yourself, looking at what happens and learning from that experience is is the foundation that everybody should be should be doing. Um, the, uh, secondly, um, there is uh, a growing library of books out there that people have written. Um, and I, I can't recommend any one specific book and uh, you have to do your diligence yourself. But I, but I, but I, I, I would take a look at um, the authors that are out there that are, that are writing and, um, and, you know, make, make some good judgment calls on your own about which things are most applicable to you. Um, because I think there, there, there's a growing set of people out there that are experimenting with what the field is calling prompt engineering um, and trying to understand what works and why and what doesn't work and why. And, um, and I think you can gain a lot from, from reading some of these books. Um, and then the third, there's, um, you know, more, more random, a more random walk <laughs> to be sure is, uh, is looking out on the internet for all of the people that are writing on this topic. Um, but I think again, if you use some discerning, um, uh, filters on whose advice you take, I think there's an enormous amount that you can get out of people's blog posts and articles about their experiences. So, so there's, there's no dearth of information to go and read. Um, I do, uh, ideally think that companies are going to launch education programs and ultimately education, uh, our, our, our education system needs to launch these programs to teach engineering, uh, uh, prompt engineering. And also the other set of skills that are necessary that I didn't mention earlier, which is, you know, don't believe everything that it tells you fact check, <laughs> uh, look for opportunities to improve. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's not use chat GPT to do my job for me. It is use chat GPT to help me do my job better, which still means you have a job to do. So that would be the other advice is just make sure you're always looking at that output uh, and, and improving it and, and correcting it. That's great advice, uh, Ted. Um, I want to, uh, and thanks for, thanks for the question. Um, I think, you know, potentially we will get your short list, Ted, of who you're reading, uh, the bloggers, the authors, your friends and your network that you've been doing this for a long time. So I'd love to know who your short list is as well. And we can maybe share it in the feed uh, after the fact. We're going to take one more question again. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining. We had a tremendous turnout. Um, and so, uh, Simon, if you could, can we bring George in, see what his question is? Yeah. Hey, all. Uh, thank you very much. Really insightful session. Um, prompted a broader question. Uh, Ted, you had mentioned stakeholder capitalism. Uh, ben, you mentioned uh, Mihir's talk at Davos. Uh, key to the fourth industrial revolution is the fu fusion of physical, digital, uh, and biological. Um, does automation anywhere have any ambitions uh, which include blending into domains outside of the digital? Wow. <laughs> That's all you, Ben. <laughs> That's a stumper. Um, you know what I could do, George? I mean, we we're we are on um, conversations all the time. What we could do is have a conversation with our chief product officer and and some of the folks in uh, in that organization and see where we're going with that because I think that's really interesting. And I know you guys have some interesting announcements coming up as well. And I think that's definitely an area that we should be exploring together. Well, and I guess the thing I would jump in and add is if for folks that aren't aware, um, Google's published some really exciting research recently um, on how large language models um, can improve the operation of physical robotics. So I, I mentioned that earlier in, in this discussion is that, you know, hey, wake up. If you're not paying attention, the whole world of physical robotics is about to change. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, Google's also been at the forefront of um, uh, research into how scientists can improve the way they investigate biological um, uh, uh, elements, right? So alpha fold. Um, and just a huge unlock for the way we're going to cure disease and and um, and other things. So so absolutely, the field. Uh, leaving aside, I'm not speaking for automation anywhere, <laughs> um, but the field certainly is hugely applicable to physical and biological, not just information um, uh, elements. Yeah, and I think I think with uh, our strategic partnership with Google as well. Um, there's a number of um, exciting developments that are happening um, and coming soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, 
So listen, uh, we are at the top of the hour. I think this was meant to be like a half hour. We went over already, but couldn't stop the conversation um, because it's so, uh, you know, it's it's so exciting. Um, and Ted, I really want to thank you for sharing your insights. Um, you know, like like we mentioned a few times, I think we could do do this all day potentially. Ben said he's buying the beer, so uh, you know, free drinks for everybody. But um, well, and I invite people to to follow me on LinkedIn and read my regular newsletter. Where I cover topics like this, so hopefully we can continue. Yeah, the and we'll put the link to your newsletter uh, in the feed. And um, to your point, um, you know, the beauty of this and be, the beauty of doing this on LinkedIn, for instance, is being able to interact one to one if we want to and, and reach out. And I know that you're you welcome that. So feel free to connect with Ted and Ben and myself. Um, and, uh, you know, let's do it again. But thanks again for uh, thanks again for the time, both to our audience. Ben, Ted, I know you guys are busy guys. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your Friday, everybody. Um, and we'll see you soon. So thanks so much. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, everybody, for joining. All right. Cheers, everyone.